Today we are very fortunate to have Renata Graw here speaking to us about her graphic design practice. Originally trained as a product designer in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil, Graw has been living and working as a graphic designer in Chicago since 1997. She received her master's degree in graphic design from the University of Illinois in Chicago in 2008. And after UIC, Renata co-founded Plural Design with fellow UIC grads Jeremiah Chu and Chris Callis. As part of Plural, Renata established herself as one of the top designers in Chicago and one of the most sought after collaborators for artists and art institutions. In 2015, I believe, Renata founded the design studio Normal along with Alexa Vicious and Crystal Zapata. Normal Design has produced an impressive portfolio of work in a short time, and it's because of this work that they were selected as one of the few firms to work on the design for the exhibition center at the Obama Presidential Center. Renata's work has been featured in Communication Arts, I in Print Magazine, and has been selected for the AIGA 365 Art Directors Club, the SGA Archive, and Type Directors Club, among others. Renata is an amazing artist, designer, and collaborator, and a leader within Chicago's creative community. So please join me in welcoming Renata Graw. So thank you, Justin, and College of DuPage for inviting me to speak here. And I do run a graphic design studio called Normal. So a lot of people ask me, why Normal? And as designers, we produce images and shape messages that need to be normal enough to fit in, but strange enough to be seen. So we need to be on the edge of normal, changing the definition of normal. I tell my clients we want to define together what normal is for them. And this is, I just want to make sure that you guys know that this work that I'm going to present today is not only my work, but it's the work of the team. We really like gifts, and it's hard to tell who it is, who is everyone, but Alexa is the blonde one, and Crystal is the other brunette on the photograph. So I've selected a handful of projects to share with you to show a bit of our process. And I, also the range of projects that I'm going to show is very, really diverse. And I'm hoping this is going to help you with your processes because you're still in school and learning and questioning all that. So I'm going to start with Tiger Strikes Asteroid. Earlier this year, the Chicago chapter for the Tiger Strikes Asteroid asked us to work on an identity for their space. So they do, it's an artist-run network, and they have spaces in Philadelphia, New York, and Los Angeles, too. And this is what they told us a little bit. And we quickly noticed that each of their spaces was really seen as an independent entity. This was the Philadelphia chapter identity, the New York space, and then the LA space. So what would Chicago be? And then during our first meeting, we also discussed their goals and aspirations. So this is something we do a lot is ask people, what do you do, you know, what do you stand for? What are your beliefs? And they actually had this written on their website too. So from these statements, we wrote down a couple of things. I'll let you guys read this one too. The things that jumped out of us was create community, empower the artists. And then we wrote on a little note, we wrote collective of collective, this idea that artists are collect collectively forming a space, but then they also have this collective of collectives that could then they tap into from other cities. So from these statements and our conversations, we started sketching and thinking about who they are. And this is, the, this is not the original sketches, but this is what we presented to them on their first meeting. So we use graphics to talk through our thoughts when we're presenting. So the Tiger Strikes Asteroids Collective, or network, could be seen as having three main parts. The connections to other chapters, the connections within the network in Chicago, and the connections to the community where the gallery is located. For us, the network was more than the sum of its parts. The network became the multiplication of its parts. And all the connections that we can trace between these parts, the possibilities for connections within the network are endless. Each time there's a connection, the network becomes stronger. And a community-based network with an inward and outward reach can be represented by a circle. This circle should be closed and open. 
a safe place for the community, but an inviting space for others. We were also interested in the possibility of making the mark out of symbols. We thought this was very fitting to replace words with icons or drawings. As artists, we are exploring how we represent the world. So why not explore what, could, what this could look like? But what could be the ideal tiger, or strike, or the ultimate asteroid? When we first heard the name, it reminded us of Dada poetry. You guys read this one too. So this is from 1920, and I'm sure you're familiar with this game of cutting up words and mixing it and rearranging and making your own poem out of it. But we thought we could create a similar solution for the identity. So what if we drew different tigers and used them as to represent the collective? Each of the drawings or symbols represents the individual, so the collective comes to life when paired with the drawing. It also adds a strange layer to the identity. What is this place? So we drew lots of tigers. We wanted the symbols to range from realistic to symbolic, from abstract to conceptual, sometimes a little silly. These are just some of the tigers we sketched. So we shared the collection with tigers with the team in Chicago, and they made a selection. So we actually also proposed to them that they would draw their own tigers and strikes and asteroids, and we would make the selection. So we were playing with this idea that they were artists creating work from other artists, but then they said, no, no, you guys draw the tigers, we'll make the selection. We're, we're actually now the curators of that. So here's their new identity. The identity is ever-changing, similar to the way in which an art collective is constantly evolving. And here's the neon sign we're still hoping they'll produce for their door. <laughs> One last element comes from the idea of deconstructing the circle. We wanted this identity to be as flexible as possible, so when appropriate, the words can be broken. This could also be used as a texture on print materials distributed at the gallery. So we told them it would be nice if they only did this for things that you get at the gallery, because you've seen the circle before as a whole. So this would be a flyer, postcard. This is an example of the banner. And then we put the broken down type on the windows as well. And then they asked us to do a mug, which is kind of fun. There it is, a mug with the tiger. And then that's the tote. To help with the Dadaist poetry, we also made a set of dice. The identity was embraced, but not only by Chicago chapter, but also the others around the country. This was not produced, by the way. We were trying to convince them to make this dice. OK, so now I'm going to talk about something totally different that we did for Type Force. So Type Force is an annual exhibition curated at, by Cope Prosperity Sphere that features artists and designers that are experimenting with typography. If you're a uh, graphic designer or an artist, you can apply. Uh, the applications, I think, are in February or January, actually, second week of January. So for the 2016-17 exhibition, I think it happened in February. Um, it happens in the winter. Normal applied a, with a piece called Alternative Facts. So this was right after the election when we did the application. And Alternative Facts is a collection of artist Jenny Holzer's truisms paired with President Trump's tweets. Um, if you don't know, Jenny Holzer began creating her truisms in the 70s as when she was still a student. She hand-typed numerous one-liners, or sh what she called truisms, and she used commercial printing processes and then distributed these sheets at random and pasted up as posters around the city. She is still recognized today for, uh, for this work. On the other hand, Trump's use of Twitter is a self-indulgent and broadcast to a wi wide audience. So we thought it was kind of interesting that she was trying to connect to a wide audience, and she is, he is connecting to a wide audience through a different medium. And so we paired these statements on a flag. And we actually use the same technique that Luftwerk is using at the gallery right now with LED changing light to reveal the two, the two phrases. So they were printed simultaneously on a flag, but then when you stood in front of the flag, the light changing LED would review one or the other. We picked red and blue for obvious reasons. So here's the flag on opening night. 
as a small a small booklet of additional quote pairings was created as a takeaway. So this was very small uh, booklet, and it all uh, it had quotes by Trump, Trump's tweeter, and Jenny Holzer's truism. Okay, so I want to um, show you also something a little bit more commercial, and it is still an art institution, but maybe not. Um, like Tiger, not a small, this is a bigger, small town institution. So we were invited by the Columbus Area Arts Council to redo their identity. This is Columbus, Indiana, not Columbus, Ohio. So Columbus, Indiana is a small town about an hour south of Indianapolis. It is also a mecca for modernist architecture. This is the town's main square with the first modernist church ever built in the United States and designed by Alan Saarinen it faces the Harry Moore sculpture. The photo was taken from the library across the plaza, designed in the 60s by I.M. Pei, the same team that would design the Louvre Pyramid years later. So this is not the only example of modernist architecture in Columbus, Indiana. There's a lot of buildings like this in the city. And this incredible architecture legacy has been sparked by an industrialist that lived in town. Mr. Miller fell in love with modernist architecture encouraged the town to use young promising architecture in the city projects. He also funded a lot of the projects himself. His own house was designed by Aero Saarinen. This is the house and this is the interior of the house. This is in Columbus, Indiana. It's about five hours from here. The interior was designed by Alexander Girard. Uh, this was uh, featured in many architecture magazines too. And the city's identity was designed by the famous graphic designer Paul Rand, commissioned by Mr. Miller himself. It features what Paul Rand named the Dancing Seas. They can still be seen in the city's visitor center. So because of the famous Paul Rand Sea, almost every entity in Columbus uses a C in their logo. So we knew we could not draw another C. And after a couple of meetings and a lot of research, we sent out a questionnaire when we work with people on identities because we want to know who they are. Uh, and these are the words that came out of those meetings and research and questionnaires. You know, they wanted to be open and inclusive, bold, simple, progressive, magical, and create connections. So we started the exercise by looking at the whole name. We wanted to stray away from the designing a C. It's a mouthful, it's long. So in the institution also referred to, to themselves as, by their acronym CAC. So we thought that was an interesting rhythm that happens here, not only with the sound, but also visually, if you break the word. There's a symmetry, but not. So this was a pretty obvious move for us. We were looking for shape, but then we lost the C. So we trimmed the circles in different places to get some C's and we started playing with these shapes and realized we could have a very dynamic and simple solution by sticking with these, these two shapes, which also reminded us of modernism. So we did a little dance, put them together, pulled them apart. These shapes gave us a lot of alternatives and lockups, yet they were strong enough to hold together as one identity. So we proposed the launch of the brand in a bright color. They asked us to stray away from red because a lot of the institutions were also using red and we thought we could take, we could propose this bright blue. When we first designed the SMART, we knew it could be uh, applied in many colors. It could be black and white and then be dressed up by art and transformed with color. But they have a very small team and they were concerned with opening up that door. So we said, why don't we start with blue you play around with the shapes first, and then when you're comfortable, we can add more colors. So there's a tote bag and a t-shirt. So when we present, we always present things in context or try to. There's a letterhead. Some people still use letterheads. City banners, and then website. And then an event poster, and then here you can kind of see one of the strategies we were proposing is putting images inside the shape. So they launched the new identity in May and have been getting great response from the, from the community, which is I think is a little bit of a surprise since it's a little unusual for a small town, but it is again Columbus, Indiana. We do interactive 
projects as well. And this is kind of interesting because Luftwerk has their show at their gallery, so you guys can see their work. Um, so they asked us to work on a site. Their site was really outdated. That you know, Sean was fighting with it all the time, and they said we need a new simple site just to put our work up. Uh, but when they asked us that, we also said, you create these incredible experiences with light and you transform spaces, so can we do the same on your website? Can we invite people to, to play and experience the world through your website the same way that you do in real life? Okay, so this is a really big proposition. You know, it's Luftwerk and they're doing incredible things, so why, how are we going to do this together? So we looked at their work, and this piece was, this is by them. This is a piece they installed at the Chicago Cultural Center a couple of years back, and invited the viewer to experience color in a very different way. And so for their website, we created this interactive piece. So by moving the mouse around, the user reveals different tones of color, inviting them to experience and play with the nuances of color tones. This is the second piece we did for them. This is not currently up. This is a piece called Seed of Light that it had installed at the Garfield Park Conservatory. So this is Luftwerk, and um, this was part of the Solarize exhibition last year. This is a chandelier that uses light and water to draw ripples on the floor. It is very beautiful and a meditative experience. So for that second experience, we did this, which is also an interactive experience inspired by Seed of Light, where the user mouses over the screen, releasing drips of water. The faster the mouse movement, the more it drips. The third one was um, inspired by Porter, which was also part of their Solarize exhibition. Porter was a series of mirrors reflecting and framing the space. At night, they, were, they used bright colors, LED, to paint the pieces in different colors. Um, so we did our version of portal. This is now horizontal to fill the space. So the center of the portal is controlled by your mouse, and then as the user clicks, you get different colors, randomly selected different colors. So the inside of the site was very straightforward. A grid of images presents their work, and then each project has its own page with more details, bigger images, videos and then the information can be opened and closed. And then the, other, the only other thing we did for them on the site is propose a small little button uh, on the edge where you can change the background. Because since they were playing a lot with light, we thought it might be nice to give them a light switch so you can turn it off and on. Um, this was a project we did with Mass Studio that is run by Iker Gill. He curated an exhibition called Bold, Alternative Scenarios for Chicago, as part of the first Chicago Architectural Biennial, so this is two years ago. The exhibition invited the public to explore architectural and urban planning alternatives for Chicago. We helped Mass Studio organize the gallery and think about how to group the projects. The projects on the show were not a radical utopian future. They were very doable ideas, for a near future based on current state of the city. So for the exhibition identity, we wanted to explore that relationship between time and line. A lot of times when we do timelines, we um, represent time in a horizontal line moving forward. So that was, a, that was something that came to mind. And then this idea that the time can project, the timeline projects us into a future while still being connected to the present or past. So we extended the horizontal lines to interrupt the conventional flow, those opening spaces in unexpected places. And of course, we like animated GIFs, so we did that. <laughs> but uh, this has a meaning, you know, the near future is not a set image. It's always changing. Something that you do today is going to affect what you do tomorrow. So this had to be moving. And we also thought the blanks in the typography offered room for new ideas. And it forces you to pause, hopefully to think about it too. Uh, we apply the typography onto three-dimensional objects within the exhibition. So the visitor was invited to physically move around the object to make sense of the collection of cryptic fragments in the cipher of the whole. 
there's a detail of that and the back of it. And that's Eker. We were invited to work on the catalog also as part of the mass context publication. So this is actually the first time, because we wanted to do the, the entry walls of the gallery with half the t title, but uh, the second wall was pretty far. So we, you know, we were a little nervous that people weren't going to walk all the way there and read the other half. It's too far. But on the catalog, we broke the title between the cover and the back cover. And the catalog follows the structure of the gallery, but in a linear form. So this is the table of contents. And um, so these are the chapter breaks. And then we divided the current projects. So there were a couple of projects within the gallery that were uh, current states of the city. And they became, in the book, represented by the black background. And then the future speculative projects were printed on white background. OK, so now I'm going to show you something a little bit more fun and maybe not so strict as a book. Um, Field and Flores is a local farm and florist store in Chicago. They just opened a little shop on Division Street. Um, it's, what's interesting about them is they are not only selling flowers wholesale and on their shop, but they are also producing the flowers locally. And they were very interested in this idea of locally grown and sustainable. But uh, they wanted to be seen as different than everybody else. Like, what are, what are, how are people photographing flowers was something that we investigated for this project. And then for the opening of the new store, we proposed a series of photographs showcasing their flowers and breaking away from the regular or what we call normal or current trends of flower photography. So these, this is a series we did for them to sort of signify that they are interested in flowers in a different way, in an artistic way maybe. So we proposed um, a series called the Pink Series, and we photographed pink flowers, all grown by them, in a different settings, very pink settings. So they brought the pink flowers to the studio and we brought pink objects. Books. This is my favorite one. And then that happened after that. And then that. This is also on their website. So for the next series to be launched in the spring 2018, we're photographing flowers underwater. Because why not? We do want to create a different imaginary world for them. There's some of the shots that we did this past summer for next summer. And at the, this is the last project I'm going to talk about. This is. Uh, the poster we just did for the College of the Page Visiting Artist Lecture Series, which is this series. <laughs> um, so when, when I saw the, the brief, I actually drew this, uh, this calendar. You know, I was intrigued by this idea of it's a series over time, so why not draw a calendar? So it's all the dates that are read are actually the dates that are gonna ha that you're gonna have lectures. But was was intriguing to me was this this idea of series and like lecture. So I was trying to highlight the series in this, and so these are some of the sketches that I did. There's a lot more, but a series of shapes over time create rhythm. Like photographing something over time, we can see it move. So the same way time affects light and gives us the illusion of movement, ideas can affect how you experience the world. So a series of shapes could be a good representation of a lecture, maybe. This might be a little too far. Um, also, lectures are about exchange of ideas. So there was a lot of arrows that were showing up on my sketches. And you know this might be something that you do on your your sketchbook, and the, the, these are formalized sketches, but I was drawing a lot of arrows, calendars, serial things. So these, the exchange of ideas invite us to make connections and give us insight, and then maybe new paths. But really, a lecture could be seen as one single entry point to a manifesto. So I like this idea of like a manifesto or one moment that you can get a glimpse into somebody's thinking, like a sheet of paper does the same thing. And a series of lectures become a series of posters, a series of manifestos. So I really like this visual because it's very, it feels like a computer, but then it has that, you know, what is it? Is it a document? Is it a sheet? And then I like this idea that it's moving. 
and it's changing, it's different things. Like you're actually, I'm here and I have to be within the same format as everybody else, but everybody has a different idea. So I place the text in a very straightforward way and actually the text repeats. The only thing that changes is the person who is speaking and the time on the side. And then the, as the text moves around, it covers the previous lectures. So you don't have access to those anymore. Those are gone. So it was nice to see that a series that functioned with static parameters, but maybe this was a little too clinical. And actually, I presented it this way in the booklet form, which was interesting because it created different connections. Uh, but the color, College of DuPage suggested maybe we should use a little color. So I went back to some of my original sketches and shapes. And actually, I did a, what sometimes we call it as a, a mashup. So you get two ideas, and you go into one direction, and then you take something that you did before, and you just mash it up. And it, it just created something sort of unexpected, the overlay of color and typography. And then every artist would get different shapes. And then this, you know, maybe you notice it more because now there's shapes. And then, you know, I also was so interested in this idea of a lecture offer you different directions or open up possibilities like it flourishes an idea. So that's the series. And then because we printed this in a newsprint, newspaper format, there was a central spread uh, with no lectures, just an after image. So this works as an after image, you know, when you see something and you close your eyes and you see it again in your head but different colors. That's sort of like that. Um, this is supposed to be an after image, inviting the viewer to hang it as a reminder of the series. Thank you. Yeah. Sorry, I'm just kidding. For bold, you're asking about bold. Yes. What was the question? Sorry. How many like sketches that you guys like did for? Sorry. So we only presented one. Um, this is something I don't do. Like if Iker was a big company with ten people, I would probably not go in with one. But sometimes if I there's one that I'm really comfortable with, I ask like, is that okay? We're only presenting one, and they're like, yeah. But uh, for Columbus project, that was one of three identities we presented because they have a board, they had to all vote, and so we we presented three solutions. They were very distinctive solutions, but um, but they asked us at the end, "Do you have a recommendation?" And we said this one, and they said that's our favorite one. They went around the room, the board voted, that was selected, which is also very rare. Normally, these board meetings can derail things quite a bit. I, I had a question. Um, because it, like looking at your work, you do work for larger companies that have more corporate clients, but also smaller, mm -hmm. more creative spaces. And I know, you know, I read in an interview with you, you talk about how different clients offer different benefits for you as a designer and also for, the, uh, for your uh, business. And since so many times our students have very practical questions about how you start, can you talk about how you look for um, different ways to gain value from a project from maybe a client that doesn't have the same budget as some of your corporate clients and how that can still be beneficial towards your practice? Sure. Um, I think many times we get upset that we don't have the budget. We're like, oh, you know, if I only had a little bit more money, I would do this, this, and this. But there's a lot of things that, that we can do as designers that um, work really well and don't need a lot of money. And I say this, be, I think I learned this really quickly in Brazil when I was doing my undergrad. In Brazil, there's a lot less money invested in culture, a lot less money invested in industry and developing our own countries, and you have to be very resourceful. So when we founded Plural, we embraced uh, newspaper printing, we embraced low quality paper, we embraced these uh, ways of printing and also 
on the web internet you can there's to set up a website it's not that much money and you can reach out a broad audience so we're always asking ourselves you know is this the best way of using your your resources because you know we do live in a world where the resources are limited and we have to be cognizant of that too so we're always encouraging our clients to think about is this the best way to use your resources no do you print we just printed a catalog for a film festival and we're asking they had no budget for a website and all the meetings we're designing the catalog we're printing the catalog and every meeting i went in and i said you should be doing online presence how can we change your model and they said we can't change it this year maybe next year so you know i'm the one person in the room that if they tell me to shut up i'll shut up but and i did design the catalog and they printed it but it's a lot of copies f where you could maybe be reaching their audience by using a website you guys know that um but sometimes it's nice to have a client that you know flies you out for a photo shoot and then you like, or you rent a nice camera and you play with it. So it's nice to have both, a little bit of both. But don't be discouraged by the no money. A lot of art movements happen without any money. <laughs> Um, you know, a lot of people tell you to trust your instincts, and I think that's a really good advice, but I also say question your instincts, because sometimes our instinct is to do what we're seeing It's really nice right now, but you ha I think it takes a while to find, takes a moment to find out what, what you're really interested in, what you really, your, your path, what, what makes you different than me and Justin and you know Petra and Sean from Luftwerk. I feel like the the more honest you are with yourself and your work, the better. And that's hard. Uh, how do you juggle like if you have a creative idea for a vision for a company versus what their ideas are for what they want you to do? So uh, I asked them. I try to be very open. We try to be very open in the studio. You know, I think the moment you walk in the meeting and you already know the answer too quick, you might not know the answer. These people, if somebody comes to me and wants us to work on a project, this should be a collaboration. They know a lot more about their market, about who they're talking to. I don't, I come from a different perspective, so it's nice that they're open to invite somebody that comes from a different perspective, but I also have to listen to them. I need to listen to what they're having to say. Like, who are the people that they're talking to? So we always ask them, what are you saying to who? Who is your audience? And what do you want to do with this thing? What do you want to tell them? So my objective, we always remember that in the studio. Now we're doing this maybe edgy work, and you know, call it what you want, but we're always asking, who do you want to talk to? And you know, if you want to talk to your grandmother, you talk to, to her in a very different way than when you talk to your peers or art students. So we, we try to understand the audience before we do anything. Like for Bold, we knew that the audience was architects for a, a space like Tiger Strikes Asteroid, we know there's a lot of the audience is uh, other artists. But we also know they're in a community, so how can you attract people from the community? Like, if you make it a little strange, they'll be like, what is that? You know, is it a Taekwondo place? Or is it, why are they striking asteroids? Or do they play video games? So we knew there was going to be that talk in that area. So that, that's the kind of thing that we asked. Uh, they're fun. <laughs> um, there's, so, there's something really nice about movement and video. So we do we do video pieces as well, and we do like 
this idea of time media base. You know, it doesn't have to be a gift per se. It could be something movement, moving. Sometimes um, things happen over time that you can't really capture if you're doing like a flat piece. You know, it's a different feeling. So we, we play around with our After Effects and Premiere and, of course, Photoshop GIF. It's also very easy to do. Like, right, you need like five frames, you're done. <laughs> we just did uh, tote bags for the show at the gallery, and we wanted to show the tote bag, so we went outside, photographed ourselves, and it may, it was, it's a GIF on our Instagram. So it's good for social media, too. A lot of art movements happen even without like the financial aspect. Like, what would you say to those who are maybe are interested in art, but haven't come to a point where they can actually make money with it yet? If that makes sense. I think that makes a lot of sense. You know, um, art is one of those strange professions that anybody, like we, we all can make art, but. The value of art is something that just, it's mind-boggling, right? You go to a show and you're like, okay, they're paying a million dollars for a painting. The bridge is re really big. And I think when we're starting, we don't see, like, there's no way a painting that I make is going to ever get into that auction. Like, how do you get to a point where you don't need a job? Um, and, and I think that's a, that's a struggle for a lot of us. And, and you have to you just whatever you do, even if you take the job, do it, do it with passion. You know, don't I, I grew up with a mother that told me, even if you're swiping the floor for your job, do it with passion. These things are important. No, cleaning is important. Swiping the floor is important. Do it with art and then you learn something from it. So when you when you get to that peaceful meditative moment, then your art can also make your way into your life in other ways, you know. I don't know if I answer that question. That's a big one. How did we get so philosophical so early? <laughs> Who uh, have been your design influences? Okay, so that's, I, I know that one. <laughs> um, when I was growing up, I, I took a leap year and I went backpacking around the world. Uh, no money, you know, yeah, of course I had the money to pay the ticket in. I had a little bit of money, but I, then I, I realized the world was like industrial design just blew my mind because I was backpacking through Europe and Asia, and I realized how culture really influences your behavior and use of objects. So I went back to Brazil like I'm going to do industrial design and I'm going to be a designer and change the world. And of course... Uh, I met my husband during the job, first job, and then we moved here. And then I fell into graphic design. So I was doing graphic design without much knowing what I was doing. And I started looking for classes and reading a lot. So I read the history of des graphic design because I, I had no idea what I was doing. So I was like, well, if I read, maybe I'll find something. And then I was very attracted to like the Swiss School of Design and then I found this little um, workshop in Switzerland by Wolfgang Weingart. And uh, I registered and I applied and I was accepted. And then I went there and I took three weeks of class with him. And then I realized I have to go back to school. I don't know anything. Uh, but I think the biggest influence is really like the, the Swiss school sort of brought me over the edge. And I will walk out of the microphone. But, um, but after that, I, my, I'm always reading and studying the history of graphic design. Like, so then I went back and I took classes in the Netherlands or Italy. So I'm always looking for what else is happening, not only Chicago and not only design, because I think graphic designers have a tendency to look at graphic design work and forget that there's film, animation, painting, interactive media. You know, there's so much happening. 
So I think, but, but the traces is like Swiss school of design and then maybe trying to not do that anymore. <laughs> but can't get away with it. <laughs>